If you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to begin. La- last week, we, we were reading from St. Matthew, chapter uh, 16. And I'm going to start there today, because as I said this morning, today is the day of Pentecost. Now, if you know anything, if you've been coming to this church for a while, I have, you know, taught on the Jewish holiday, Jewish feast days. God gave Israel seven feast days, seven days of celebration. And each one of those feast days had a uh, prophetic purpose, looked forward to some aspect of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And to go into that in great detail would be kind of too much for today. But uh, basically, the, the spring feasts, there were four feasts in the spring of the year. The first one was Passover, which would have been in April. Uh, the second one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which began at the Passover and lasted for seven days. The third one was the Feast of the First Fruits, which was the first Sunday, uh, after, uh, the first, the Sunday during the Feast of uh, unleavened bread. And then there was the Feast of Pentecost. And the word Pentecost means 50 days. 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits was the Feast of Pentecost. How many people know what happened on the Feast of First Fruits? Anybody know? Bible scholars? The Sunday after the crucifixion, what happened? Jesus was what? He was resurrected. He was raised from the dead. Uh, 50 days after that was the Feast of Pentecost that we're going to read about today. It has a significance because when Jesus was raised from the dead, or or, or the the day before Jesus was crucified, if you turn to John chapter 14, we're not going to turn there, but if you read that chapter, John 14, Jesus told his disciples this. He said, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you another comforter, okay, a comforter. Now we know that Jesus went on to explain in John chapter 14 and 15 and so forth that the comforter was who? The Holy Spirit. Now we believe in God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Somebody say, well, where was the Holy Spirit? Wasn't he here before that? The Holy Spirit has always been active on the earth from creation until now and until Christ returns. But his office is a little different. See, people think there's a difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. There are some differences, but there are some things that will never be different. God never changes. That means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been the same. The, the way of salvation has never changed. See, some people listen to that and they say, wait a minute, in the Old Testament, didn't they have the law and all this other stuff? They had that. But they were saved the same way we're saved. They're saved by faith. Faith saves us. What has changed is how God has revealed himself to us. Okay? Now, in Matthew chapter 16, and we read this last week, we're going to read it again just as a beginning uh, for our message today. Starting at verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that's the verse I want to begin with, verse 18. Jesus said to Peter, you're Peter, and upon this rock, he wasn't talking, Peter is not the rock. Okay, don't get that, don't get that mixed up. Jesus is the rock. He's the foundation. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. Now that word church is a Greek word, and it's the word ecclesia. Or ecclesia. I'm a, it depends on where you want to put the accent. And it means a called out assembly. A called out assembly. Now when Jesus used that word there with his disciples, they were thinking, his disciples were thinking, 
Israel. See, see, we have to understand, they did not have, the New Testament wasn't written then. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, my called out assembly, my ecclesia, his disciples could think of nothing but the nation of Israel. Because in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel were God's chosen people. He chose a nation called the Hebrews, Israelites. We use the term Jew, but Jew really refers more just to like one tribe. They're the Israelites, the Hebrews, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. God called them. He called them to be separate from all the other nations. And he said, you're going to be my people and I'll be your God. And if you remember, when they came out of Egypt, they went to a place called Mount Sinai. Uh, about, and it was at like 50 days after they left Egypt, they went to a place called Mount Sinai. Moses went up to the Mount Sinai, and God gave him what? He gave him the Ten Commandments. How many remember them? Okay. He gave him the Ten Commandments. And, and he made a covenant with the nation of Israel. He says, if you do my commandments, I will bless you. If you don't do my commandments, then you're going to suffer consequences. How many people know they didn't do his commandments? Matter of fact, it only took them about 30 days before they blew that one, okay, with the golden calf, and that's another story. But God made a covenant with his called-out nation, his, his ecclesia, his called-out nation, Israel. He made a covenant with them. He said, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, here's the law. Uh, I'll give you the Ten Commandments, and he gave them about 400 other commandments upon, uh, uh, over and above that. And he said, follow my commandments, be my, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. Well, they didn't do a very good job of it. And for a few a thousand years, they were, you know, the Jewish people were going back and forth and back and forth. They'd fall into idolatry. God would send, uh, you know, uh, 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 an oppressor, and they would call out and so forth. And we all know that history. Okay, now, <clears throat> when Jesus was talking here in, in Matthew chapter 16 about his church, he knew what he was talking about, but his disciples didn't. They were thinking Israel, because that's all they knew. But Jesus knew something else. How many people know Jesus knows more than we do? Okay, okay. Now, I want you to turn with me, just, as, just to kind of set the stage, over to the book of Acts. And of course, if, you know, if you're in a Pentecostal church and it's the day of Pentecost, you're going to turn to the book of Acts, right? Uh, and I want to say this too, you know, the church of God, this church, we call ourselves a Pentecostal church. Somebody say, well, what in the world does that mean? Some people think, you know, Pentecostal, that means they're, they're nuts. <laughs> they're crazy. All the term Pentecostal means is we believe that what we're going to read about here in Acts chapter 2 is still for today. That the gifts that God gave, the move of the Holy Spirit that we're going to read about here that was different, new, something different, is still for today. It didn't pass away. Some folks say, well, that passed away in the first century and so forth. Well, there's nothing in the scriptures to indicate that it passed away. So if I read the Bible and I'm going to take it at face value, I have to believe that what started on the day of Pentecost that we're going to read about here is still going on right now. At least it should be. And it is. Okay? But in, in Acts chapter 1, let's go there first. The book of Acts chapter 1. And verse 4. This is Jesus. He's with his disciples. This is after his crucifixion. He... Uh, was teaching them for 40 days. He'd been with them for 40 days. And it says in verse 4 of chapter 1, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. Wait for the promise of the Father. I told you God has a promise. He's going to do something for you. And he says you've got to wait for it. For John truly baptized with water, in verse 5, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. If you go there and you wait for me, you're going to receive an immersion. The word baptized means to be immersed. You're going to receive an immersion in the Holy Spirit. Now, some people say the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit's always been here. He was here in the Old Testament. King David said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Believers, anybody that believed in God, uh, that, that you know, had faith, had the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, we find that the Holy Spirit manifested himself certain times with certain people for certain situations outwardly. People like Samson and uh, 
Gideon and so forth. There were times when God would put his spear on them and they received supernatural strength and so forth at uh, certain times at certain places. But it's different now. Now, now listen to what God say, listen to what Jesus says. Uh, look at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will at this time, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this, you know, they, that was been their question all along. When, Jesus, are you going to bring the kingdom back to your chosen people, Israel? They were thinking Israel, your ecclesia. You said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against your ecclesia, and they were thinking Israel. But God had something else in mind. And Jesus said unto them in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Okay, please write that big somewhere, okay, that you can see it every day. So when you hear one of these nuts on that say, you know, the world's going to come to an end. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Verse 8. But you shall receive what? Power. 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 You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto all the uttermost part of the earth. So this thing they were waiting for, that they didn't have a clue. They didn't know what they were waiting for. But Jesus said, when you receive this thing that I have promised you, that God has, the Father has promised you, you're going to get something that nobody's ever had before. Hallelujah. This is why Jesus said, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist, he had the Holy Spirit dwelling. As a matter of fact, he said he had the Holy Spirit from before he was born. But he didn't have the Holy Spirit like they were going to get the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's something different. See, see God, is, God was getting ready to, to call out a people, a Spirit-empowered people. And... The, the Spirit was given for one purpose and one purpose only. This is something else you need to write big somewhere in your house. To, be, to help us to be witnesses. The Holy Spirit is given and all the gifts and all the power and all that stuff was given for one purpose. To spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now. He says. He says, you shall receive power. This is verse 8. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. He, he told them this and the next thing they know, he's going up. No strings. <laughs> they didn't have one of those strings you know, to pull him up. He, just, he went up. And while they were looking up, if you read the story, a couple of angels were sitting there and said, what are you looking up for? Go do what he said to do. Go back to Jerusalem and wait and wait and wait. Okay? Now, now look at chapter 2. And it says this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, it's going to be like 10 days later after what we just read in Acts chapter 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were doing what Jesus told them to do. They went to a room, and they were waiting. They didn't know what they were waiting for. God, Jesus did not give them a detailed inf you know, inf information sheet of what to expect. I get a kick out of some places where, and, and I'm, you, know, I'm not, you walk into some churches, and they'll say, this is what you can expect you know, in our church. You might see this, you might see that. Jesus did not give them an outline of, you know, this is what's going to happen to you, all right? They were just waiting. We like to put ourselves in their, in, their, in their position. I always like when I read these stories, we've read them over and over, and some of you have read these stories over and over and over again, and you have a preconceived, you know what's going to happen. But boy, if you could just kind of erase that, man, just think if you were one of them in that room just waiting and praying, and you don't know what to expect. You know, you've seen this Jesus come and heal people, then they crucified him, and you thought he was done, and then he raised from the dead, and then you've seen him fly up in the air, and the angel said, go back, he's going to come back the same way he left, just go back and do what he said to do. And so you're sitting in this room, and you're just waiting, and you don't know what to expect. And suddenly, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. I guess if they lived today, they would probably say it sounded like a freight train. That's what they say a tornado sounds like. I've never been in one and never want to be in one. Okay? But that's what they say. It's like, 
all right? They heard the sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The sound. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now, think for a minute. Remember I mentioned earlier about up on Mount Sinai, the giving of the law, remember? It was like 50 days after they left Egypt, they ended up on Mount Sinai. Okay? What was up there on Mount Sinai? Thunder and lightning and fire and smoke. The people were terrified. They didn't want to go near the place. Because there, there was all this, it's like my dog when the thunders, you know, she wants to go in the house and she wants to come out of the house. She, they get scared, man. They were scared. They didn't know what to expect. God was on that mountain. And there was thunder and smoke and lightning and, and all this other stuff. And only Moses went up. Well, now here's these about 120 people in this room. And what, what happens? They hear the wind. And they see the fire come down. And it says... And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all, what? Filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to, what? Speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Listen, if it happened to them, why shouldn't it happen to us? What's different? We're waiting on God. See, see the difference between the Old Testament and the New, believer, the Old Testament believer had the Holy Spirit. But this is something different. This is something new. This is something that God had promised that had never happened before. See, in the Old Testament, there were certain times and certain places where the Holy Spirit would move on somebody to give them you know, power. But in the New Testament, we all that know Jesus Christ, every one of us that count Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that have been born again and saved, we all have access to that power, the same power that rested upon them. And we don't have to hype it up, and we don't have to dig it up, and you know, all we, all we need to do is let it happen. It's inside of you. The Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. God wants to immerse you in power of that Holy Spirit. It says, listen to what it says. They were all filled, verse 4, with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven because it was a feast day. So there were Jews from every, all different corners of the earth. Now when this was noised abroad, they could not keep this in the, in the room, okay? When, when, when it started going around, and it must, have, it must have been for more than like, you know, a few minutes because this was going on. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and all these... Nations, funny nations with funny names. Verse 12, uh, uh, verse 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, what? The wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what is this? Others mocking said, these guys are just drunk. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. Some people read this and they think, well, if I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to start acting drunk. And what a lot of them do is they, they figure if I start acting drunk first, I'll get filled with the Holy Spirit. Come and say, that's, just, that's just stupid. I mean, there are people, you know, they, I, I do this, and, and they'll do, you know, they'll bounce off walls and everything, they'll do all this stuff, and they'll well, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to be speaking things that's going to glorify God. I can't glorify God acting like an idiot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you see some of that stuff. And, 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 you know, I'm all for God moving. I believe in getting slain in the Spirit. I believe in God. You know, God can touch you and you can... I'm, I'm all for that. That's great. But some people, they do that first and think if I do this enough, and now, then, uh, yeah, God will start to move. They'll hyperventilate, make themselves dizzy. And say, oh, oh, the Holy Spirit. Listen. It says that we heard them glorify... 
This is the whole purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can feel His presence. Yes, you can, I'm, I've, I've been slain in the Spirit by the power of God. Yes, I've seen God move and people will cry and laugh and all those things. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing those things. But it's important that we understand the purpose for all of that stuff is to glorify God. There's a lot of people just doing that because it's fun. It says... They were all amazed. And they said one to another, what does this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Verse 14. But Peter, wonderful Peter. Peter whose mouth got himself in trouble so many times, it wasn't even funny. Peter who just 50 days before this denied he knew Jesus Christ because some little girl said, you're one of them, and he denied with a curse. You read about it. This same Peter stood up with the eleven and he lifted up his voice and he began to preach a message. I said, what happened to Peter? Here's what happened to Peter. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was a believer before. He had the Holy Spirit before because he was a believer. But now we find out that there is a thing called the baptism in the Holy Spirit that endues us with power to be witnesses. It takes away the inhibitions. It takes away the doubts. The Holy Spirit will erase the fears that we have. Because sometimes we're afraid to talk to people. I've been there too. You know, when I find myself being afraid to talk to people about Jesus, I say, Lord, I need to be baptized again. <laughs> Not saved. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit again. Because if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, He will give you the power to, to speak His glory to somebody. Because that's what it's all about. Now, what happened on this day of Pentecost? Remember we said... That in the Old Testament, the ecclesia, the called out assembly, was who? The nation of Israel. But now there's something new. It took them about 15 or 20 years to figure out that what we're reading about here wasn't just for the Jews. That's what they thought. And in fact, the first, the first dissension that happened in the body was, you know, what are we going to do with these? Because Gentiles started getting saved. You read about over in chapter 9 when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier. And uh, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. They never got baptized, never got circumcised, never. But yet they, they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because salvation is for all. And these gifts are for all. The ecclesia is not a nation now. It's a people. It's a body called the church of God. I'm not talking about the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. I'm talking about the body of believers all over the world with different names, and different denominations, different things on the building. That doesn't mean anything. What really matters is the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside. That's what makes us one. That's what makes us part of the called out assembly, the ecclesia, that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against. Satan can't do anything to overcome you if you've got the Holy Spirit living inside. You know that? The battles will come. I'm telling you, the battles will come, and they can be pretty rough sometimes. But Satan cannot win over a spirit-filled believer. He can't win. He likes to make you think he's winning. And what he does is he, he gets you to take your eyes off of what God's Word says and gets you to put them on what's going on around you. We talked about Wednesday night, we were talking about Abraham. In the book of Genesis. How Abraham was a friend of God, believed God it was kind to him for righteousness. God promised him he would have a son, and his, his wife became pregnant. And what did Abraham do? He took his eyes off the truth and ended up almost giving his wife away to a, to a meager king because he didn't want to get killed. That's a long story. You can read it in Genesis chapter 20. But when we take our eyes, listen, when you take your eyes off the things of God, when you take your eyes off the promise of God, I guarantee you every time you'll go back to the same vomit you came from. You'll go back to the same strongholds, the same stuff that you find yourself wallowing in before. When you take your eyes off the promise of God, you'll always go back to what you came from. That's what Abraham did. But Peter lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit 
upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters and shall prophesy, and your young, young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon and blood and so forth. He's, he's quoting this prophecy. He says, what you're seeing is a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. That God is, and, and Peter didn't fully understand this at this time, but what he's saying is this. God's taking his blessing off of one nation, and he's putting it upon all believers. Thank God we don't have to be Jewish to be saved. Listen, and, 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 and this, this message is so, really, it's just, it's just so good to read. But uh, drop down to verse 37. We're going to look one more place. <clears throat> Peter preached this message from the Old Testament. He couldn't preach from John chapter 3. He couldn't preach from Romans 10, 9, and 10. It hadn't been written yet. He preached from, from the Old Testament. And when he preached, this is what happens, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Well, let's look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, spirit-anointed preaching will bring conviction. When, this, when you're anointed by the Holy Spirit, and even, whether it's preaching or even witnessing, if you're out there and you're talking to somebody say, God, anoint me with the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit move, a spiritual Christian, when they speak God's word, it will bring conviction to somebody. Some folks don't like to hear conviction. That's why when you talk to some folks, they'll say, hey, leave me alone. Okay. And so what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call in the first century. Oh, wait a minute, it doesn't say that, does it? Whoever, from our children and our children's children, you know what, that includes me. Whosoever God shall call, Peter did not put a time limit on that. That the promise of God, of the anointing and filling of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. He doesn't want to fill you with the Holy Ghost to make you act funny. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you could be witnesses. When, when the gifts are exercised within the church, when somebody gives a prophecy or somebody gives an encouragement, it's all for the purpose of taking our witness to the people that need to hear. That's why we come here. We don't come here just for the sake of having something to do on a Sunday morning. We come here to be equipped, to be taught, to be encouraged, to be edified, to be built up, sometimes to be convicted, sometimes to be, to be you know, addressed. Maybe there's some things we need to address. Whatever it might be, it's all for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. It's all for the purpose of building up the called out assembly so that we can go forth, preach the word of God to, in Judea and Samaria and all the world earth in Arnold, New Kensington, Lower Borough and everywhere and, and preach the gospel everywhere God sends us and be anointed by the Holy Spirit and have it mean something to somebody. You know, the gospel got to mean something to somebody. I'm so tired of just religion that church is church. You know, we go to church. Oh, I feel good. I went to church. Well, that's all right. But the gospel got to mean something. Mean something. The Holy Spirit was given to help us let a dying world know that God means something when He sent His Son, Jesus. I want you to look one more place with me. And, and please read this. Uh, but, well, now look at this. Now let's just read this a little bit more. Uh, verse 40. And with many other words did He testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received the word and were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. This Peter that ran from a little woman preached a message out of the Old Testament. Three thousand people got saved and baptized that day. Ain't that something? Man, I'd like, I'd like to have a meeting like that. I think if I stand in front of three thousand people, I'd probably be too scared. But, but no, I wouldn't be if I had the Holy Spirit working. Peter wasn't afraid. If you go on and read the book of Acts, they threatened him. They beat him up. He still, he, he still preached. 
See, you know why? Because the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. I want you to read one, one more thing with me. We're going we're gonna to close up. Over in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which is like the church epistle. And look at the chapter uh, 21. Is this mic working? It's not? Okay. Can you? All right. Okay. I said a little light didn't come on. Maybe the battery's dead. I don't know. You can all hear me all right, can't you? I'm talking loud enough. All right. Look at, look at chapter uh, 1 of Ephesians. Uh, Uh, and, and, and look at verse 22. And I, there's a, look at verse 20, 22. He's talking about Jesus. He says, And the Father has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, the ecclesia, okay, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The church, the body of Christ, who we are, as believers. We are the body of Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, everything that this world can know about Jesus, they should be able to see in us. Now listen to what he says. And you, he's speaking to the believers in Ephesus, who are mostly Gentiles. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. I was at one time a child of disobedience, among whom also we had our lifestyle in times past, Paul is saying. Uh, look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the body of Christ. See, that's something that the Old Testament saint couldn't say. That's something that when he presented his blood, when he died on the cross and presented his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, he made it possible for us to be seated with him in heavenly places. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Just drop down a little bit. Uh, look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. See, at one time the Jews thought the Gentiles were unclean, could never ever enter the presence of God unless they became Jews and were circumcised. He says, at that time you were without Christ, verse 12, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, now here's, one, here's what I want to get to. In Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by what? The blood of Christ. He's speaking this to Gentiles. He's speaking this, you know, in, before the cross, the, the called out people, the, the nation of Israel thought the Gentiles were unsaved, unsavable, okay? For he is our peace who's made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition. Jesus Christ broke down the division between Jew and Gentile. See, we, we sing this, that song, He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. And we sing that, you know, if we're going through a struggle and we need peace, we need God to give us peace. But that peace he's talking about isn't necessarily peace with God. It's peace between Jew and Gentile. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, a new man, a new thing. The church is a new thing that began on the day of Pentecost and is going till today. It's not Jew. It's not Gentile. It's all who believe. And all who believe, Jew or Gentile, black, white, rich, poor, Episcopal, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, pick whatever name you want. He said that he made one new man. And that he might reconcile, in verse 16, both, God, both unto God, Jew and Gentile, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You see, we're all saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. No longer is it a national thing. 
No longer is it a hereditary thing. Now it is a faith thing. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. See, in the Old Testament, they had to come to the priest. They had to bring an offering. They had to bring a sacrifice. They had, the priest had to take it and take the blood out. And, and you read about all those offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament. But now, we don't have to do that, thank God. We all can go boldly to the throne of grace. Now, therefore, he says in verse 19, You, therefore, are, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Listen, Jesus Christ, is we're built upon him. He's the cornerstone. The teaching of the New Testament is the foundation, and we're all like living stones being built in this building called the church, not this building that's falling apart. But the body of Christ had its birth on the day of Pentecost. I want to ask you this morning, and there's so much more. We could go into so much detail, and we'd be here too long. But I want to ask you this morning, I want to ask you this. Ask yourself this. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ? I didn't ask you when the last time you told somebody about the church. I didn't ask that. When was the last time you told somebody about your faith in Jesus Christ? And let me ask you this. When you, when you get into a situation where they're screaming to hear your testimony, have you ever been there? I've been there a number of times in my life when I was talking to somebody and they started saying things and it was like the Holy Spirit was saying, say something, you dummy. Tell them about Jesus. And sad to say, I have not always responded. And when I don't respond, boy, I hear about it <laughs> from the Lord. Have you ever been in a position where God was just, the, the Holy Spirit was saying, say something, and you kept your mouth shut? Have you ever been there? I want to tell you something. When I, when I have an experience like that, I go back and I say, Lord, I need filled up again. I need filled up. There should never be a time, and I'm not talking about myself as a preacher, just as a Christian. If I never preach another message, if I leave the ministry, it doesn't matter. Just as a believer, we're all called to be witnesses. And the Holy Spirit is given to give us power to be witnesses. How many want to be a witness? How many want to be a witness? See, some people are afraid. When you talk about the baptism or the immersion in the Holy Spirit, they get afraid because they think it's spooky. Talking in the tongue. But it's the power of God. It's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, that God would manifest His gifts and His callings in the body of Christ, that He would edify us to be, to be a, a church that would be a, a church hungering for the, for the souls of the lost. That's what we got to be about. The people who are lost and hurting and dying out there, some of them don't even want to hear nothing about God. But God might use you to say something to them that will, that will click in their spirit. There are some people that you could talk to that wouldn't give me the time of day. But you say the right word at the right time, and something will click. You see, it's important that we understand that we need to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. Whether we do things in here or out there, God, let us walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer. You know, Thursday evenings we come and we pray, and one of the things we pray, that everybody would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Everybody would be so full of the Holy Ghost that when you walk into a store or when you walk into a restaurant, they look at you and say, man, there's something about that guy. And I'm not saying, I mean, you can put the T-shirt on, okay? I'm not talking about that. See, I believe that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's, a, there's an anointing that's tangible that people will sense. Rose and I, uh, when we were down, when we went on vacation, we, uh, we were eating at the, at the restaurant there, and there was a, a woman who was waiting. And she came up to the table, and she looked flustered. 
And I said, can we pray for you? Because when we go out to eat, we always tell the waitress we're praying for them, you know. Sometimes they respond. Sometimes I say, yeah, thanks. You know, I'm gonna leave. But she said, oh, and she was from Africa. I think she was from uh, South Africa, I think she's. And she was, she was, oh, they're putting a lot of pressure on us. Put, <laughs> and we prayed with her. She grabbed, I, we, both her and I both knew she was, a, she was a believer. You could just tell. God, I pray that people can tell I'm a believer. I pray that, pe- I pray that everybody in my church, so I pray for all the churches, but I'm, I, I think I just have enough faith for my church. So I pray for all of them. That's good. So I pray that everybody in my church will be so filled with the Holy Spirit that it would not only cause you to live holy, but cause people to see and sense the presence of God in you. And as somewhere down the line, they'll come up to you and say, man, what do you have? What is it about you? What is it? Something that the world can't give, something that you can't learn about, something that you can't, you know, get a degree in. It's something that God, only God can give. God, give us the power to be witnesses. I want to pray this morning, and we're going to close. How many of you want to be a witness? You want to be a witness? I don't speak well. I don't know enough about the Bible. Listen, all you got to do is be filled with the Holy Ghost, and God will make you a witness. He'll give you the words you need to say. He'll tell you when to say them, and he'll tell you when not to say them. All you need is to ask God, say, God, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Just stand with me as we close. Father, I want to pray this morning. Baptize us. God, baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray there would be an outpouring of your Spirit in this congregation, in this body of believers, that everybody in this place that names the name of Jesus Christ as their Savior would be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of of Jesus. Father, we're here in this upper chamber, and I pray and believe that we're all in one accord. The first thing, the first thing I need to ask is to make sure everybody's saved. Don't ask for baptism in the Holy Spirit if you ain't saved. <laughs> That's number one. You need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you do, if you don't, then come up and talk to me after service. If you don't and you want to. Come up and talk to me after service. But Father, my prayer is, I know this church is, I know most of the people in this room, I know they're they're believers, their their faith is in Jesus Christ. Now Father, we need power. We need power to be witnesses. That means to live lives that are glorifying unto you and to be able to open up our mouth and speak your word as the Spirit gives us utterance. Whether it be the gift of tongues exercise to speak another language or whether it be praying in the spirit or whether it be giving a prophecy or testimony or whatever it might be father i pray your gifts would flow in our congregation that we would take away every inhibition that we would take away every prohibition that we would move and act according to your word for the edification of the body of christ that we might receive power to be witnesses to a lost and dying neighborhood Father, we look around us and we see decay and despair. And the only hope is faith in Jesus Christ. Father, my prayer is that everybody in this room will be filled with the Holy Ghost and used for your glory. God, you're the one who does the work. You're the one who gives the gifts. I pray, Lord, that you would manifest yourself to everybody in this room who is saying in their heart right now, God, I want what you have for me. I want to to be the person you want me to be. And I pray, Lord, you would bring salvation. You would use us to bring salvation to our neighborhoods, to our households. Father, that you would use us for your glory. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ.